right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Todd Capone, who is in a beautifully, probably cold and wet Chicago. How are you doing, Todd? I'm good. I'm good. I feel like uh, Regis Philbin on Letterman, like a returning guest here. This is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> great to to welcome Todd back. Last time when Todd was here, we were talking about his, his, uh, his other book, The Transparency Sale. But today, what we're going to talk about is The Transparent Sales Leader. And Todd's an acclaimed author, speaker, and sales leadership professional and CEO and founder of Sales Mellon. And okay, so what we're going to talk about today is, as I said, the new book, The Transparent Sales Leader, How the Power of Sincerity, Science and Structure Can Transform Your Sales Team Results. And I think you have the book there in front of you. I do. You I do. The... Here's the hardcover. So excellent. Excellent. So um, let, let's get straight into it, Todd. Uh, after the, the, you know, the transparent sale, what, why did you decide to move to sales management? I mean, I think it's a great, great, great thing that you did, but just give me the genesis of that. Well, I'll tell you, I actually was planning to, I, I always knew that I wanted to write a book. Um, and so like six years ago, this structure for this book was going to be my first book. And then after I wrote the uh, outline, I was like, this isn't there yet. And I ended up writing the transparency sale first, but Here's kind of like the, the Cliff Notes version of the book. I, for me, back in like 2008, I got promoted from being a sales rep to being the sales leader of a small mm -hmm. tech company. And like, I don't know about any of you that are listening or watching this, but you go from having a structure and a process as a sales rep, right? You got all your processes, you got all this support. Now I'm a sales leader and like, where did my structure go? Where did my process go? I, I felt like every morning after being really excited about the promotion, I'm like, I'm like a dog chasing a car down the street. I, every day, the car is going in a different direction and I'm just chasing it, whether it's a recruiting issue, a deal issue, a pipeline, like whatever. I'm too much of a nerd for that. So back in 2008, I created a structure, of basically a sales leadership process for myself. And then over the last you know, 14 years, I've optimized each mm -hmm. element for the behavioral science and laid it on a bed of transparency. And it served me really, really well. And I got to the point where I'm like, hey, listen, as the economy constricts, things tighten up, the need for optimized sales leadership goes up as the economy goes down. And I really wanted to get this thing out there. And that, that kind of, that was the impotence behind it. I always knew I was going to write it, but it felt more urgent here in 2022. Yeah, and and what I like about that too uh, uh, Todd is that what you what you describe in there is the experience of probably 95% of of sales leaders, you know, they were top sales people, they were doing really well, then they're promoted into um <laughs> promoted into sales leadership and then the tenure is like 15 months or something, something ridiculous like that for generally because you're parachuted into this position. And most companies don't think, oh, maybe he needs some leadership training. Maybe there is actually, as you said, maybe there are people out there can help with the structure and setting it up. It's just like, well, he's a great salesperson. All he has to do is make everybody be like him. Exactly. Well, that was it. I mean, you've got to be prepared to know that as a sales rep, it is the ultimate independent role. And mm -hmm. your responsibility is to yep. transfer confidence and trust to the customer. You move into leadership, it is the most dependent role in the sales organization. It's lonely, right? Like you don't have these team of peers, like it's up to you and your job is to transfer confidence to your reps. It's like 180 degrees from what being a sales rep is. And again, if you don't have a structure or a process to fall back on, it, you end up chasing deals and chasing the forecast and all of a sudden all yep. these holes are forming all around you and you don't see them until it's too late. And that's, that was the thing that drove me nuts, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And once I just internalized it, it's called the five F's of building revenue capacities, the structure, and I can rattle right. those off for you here in a minute. But yeah. once you've internalized those, you always have a 30, 60, mm -hmm. 90 day plan in your pocket. Um, you can, strategize and communicate always. I mean, it's ready. 
I used it for my board meeting agendas, my one-on-one -on -one agendas, when I was interviewing, when I was being interviewed, when I uh, did all hands meetings with the team. I used it for due diligence when we were evaluating investments. It's super easy, man. Like I, it, it probably could have been a pamphlet if it wasn't for all the behavioral <laughs> science that's in it. Right. Um, and, and so the idea of, of transparency then, because I feel like there's a few things that um, are being repeated ad nauseum over the last couple of years as authenticity uh, and transparency is one of those ones that I would throw into that uh, into, on that bingo card. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about transparency, you kind of define it properly for us, because um, I, I don't think people I think I don't think people really understand what is meant by transparency. Exactly. And it's funny because it does it does get mixed with authenticity. And authenticity, mm -hmm. it's it's good, right? Like you, you should be authentic. You should be bring your best self, bring yourself to work every day. But like, what if you're authentically a jerk, right? Like that, that <laughs> authentically is you, and you can actually get into trouble with being an authentic leader if you really do the research. And I've got a part of the book where I just kind of break this down, where all of a sudden your beliefs and uh, morals and all of that come to stand for your team, and that that's not good. Transparency is about playing your cards face up. You know, we as human beings, we're prediction machines, right? Like we are, when we go to bed at night, when we know what our, we're getting ourselves into the next morning, that's when we sleep our best. We do our best work. Our IQ goes up and we become advocates for our organization. Transparency is about being able to share what those expectations are going to be, cards face up. Being able to share with your team how you think about things, what you prioritize, what you're great at, where you even need help, right? Transparency is about this idea of cards face up leadership so that everybody can predict. The, the, the line that I'll kind of leave you with on that question is when I first got promoted, so 2008, I, I was in my what mid thirties maybe, I, that made me the youngest person in the whole revenue organization. Right. And I remember getting the job and the CEO is like, Todd, you got to be more like you, you got to crack the whip a little bit. And I was like, dude, that's mm -hmm. not me. Um, I immediately went to him and said, listen, and I told the whole team this. I'm not any more important than any of you. We just have different responsibilities. Right. Here's my responsibilities. And I'm going to and that primarily is to help you to clear the road of the obstacles right. that you face and mm -hmm. help optimize your performance. And here's where I need the help. That's transparency, right? Cards face up. You're all peers with just different responsibilities. Yeah, and no, I, and, I, and I love that, and and the idea of of its different responsibilities. And I think that that's a key thing because sometimes when people move into sales management, they they just think that they have super salesperson responsibilities. Yeah. So rather than just looking after yourself, you're the super seller for all these other sellers. So you end up parachuting in and causing mayhem at the end of deals and all of that good stuff. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah. So how do you, how do you go back to your framework? How do you start to set it up for success? Cause I, I think that's the greatest thing because so many people default into it and they have just a nightmare time of it. So how do you set it up for success from the get go? Yeah, I mean, I'll rattle off the five for you. And Please. after you listen to this, everybody, like just write them down and you'll be 98% ahead of everybody that doesn't have a structure, <laughs> number one. Number two, you don't even have to buy a book. You'll already be 98% ahead. Um, all of your responsibilities as a sales leader, really a revenue leader, fall into one of five buckets. All right, here are the five. Number one, you have a responsibility initially, but ongoing to the focus of your team, meaning, when your team wakes up, their most precious asset they have to turn into revenue is their time. Are they optimizing their time working? So by focus, I'm talking about the right firmographics, meaning are we going after the right company sizes, geos, verticals, the demographics like are within those organizations? Are we finding the right people at the right levels or right responsibilities? And you know, it could be the prerequisites. There are certain things that companies must have to be optimal for your solution. Focus, figure it out optimize for it. The second F is then to build the field, the F field organization to support that focus, not the other way around. The field means the right people with the right experiences in the right places, with the right tools and the right resources. All right. So you've got a field organization yep. to support that focus. And that's your responsibility to build it, optimize it, maintain it. 
And the third F then is to the fundamentals. You as a revenue leader have a responsibility to make sure that field is doing the right things right consistently, right? Like their qualification, discovery, uh, sales process execution, presenting, prospect, like all that. That's on you. So fundamentals. The fourth F, no shock, is to the forecast. You have a responsibility to be able to predict the future. And in that forecast bucket, mm -hmm. the KPIs, the metrics, what you should be measuring to be proactive instead of reactive. And then the fifth F, arguably the cheesiest, but maybe the most important is fun. And by fun, I'm not talking about cotton candy and lollipops. I'm talking about <laughs> creating a culture where your team wants to show up every day, stay and do their best. I actually dedicate a whole section of the book to what I call the science of intrinsic inspiration. And then how do you apply that in your sales organizations of the things that actually drive us from an engagement perspective? But those are the five. Focus the team. Make sure that that team is optimized for that focus. Make sure they get the fundamentals right. You got to forecast. And then you've got to create a fun culture so that your team does their best, stays, and advocates for mm -hmm. you and your organization. You internalize those five. As soon as you get done listening to this, you could create a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Like, here's where we are. Here's where the holes are. Here's what we do. Always. And that's that's the magic of it. Yeah. And and what I love about the, the fact that it starts with focus, because um, often oftentimes, especially when the going gets a little bit tough, you can let your focus get very diluted very quickly because you can start to go, oh, yeah, we're focused on this type of prospect, right? This is our target. But this one... Yeah, they're not a hundred percent, but they're close enough. And then the one next to that, yeah, well, a little bit further, but there's still. And before you know it, your pipeline is full of uh, opportunities that shouldn't be there. Right. Exactly. I actually, um, it's something that I've been kind of screaming from the mountaintops here, is that as things get tougher, to your point, John, that we tend to want to cast a wider net, and mm -hmm. our qualification criteria is: do they got money in their wallet? Right. Yeah, like, yeah. That's it. I actually, so one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this is back in 2008 and 2009 during the Great uh, Recession, I convinced my CEO to do this. We decided to, instead of casting a wider net, I wanted to go tighter. I call it extreme yeah. firmographic focus, which means mm -hmm. we were having a lot of success with like aerospace and defense companies. Why? Well, you know what? Because our messaging really tailors to them and we, there's enough to go after their big dollars our win rates are good and they're seeing the magic fest so our cycle links are pretty short hey for the next four weeks what i want to do is we're gonna and so what we did we brought in a consultant from the aerospace and defense industry who spent time with my reps teaching them all the lingo how people are measured right. what they read what events they go to what stands out to them we we started there had marketing build, like look at our aerospace defense customers and go, all right, all the focus for the next few weeks is on case studies around those. Let's educate the team. The next, and then we brought in our couple of customers to share those same things. What do they care about? How are they measured? What do they listen to and read? And what does their inbox look like? The right. next thing you know, the team, we didn't constrict their territories. We gave instead of taking away. The team, when they'd wake up in the morning, they're all calling on aerospace and defense. And the next thing you know, we get Boeing, Gulfstream, Cessna, uh, Northrop Grumman, and we're growing. Instead of all of a sudden going out of business, we went the opposite. We grew 400% year over year, sold the business to SAP in 2011. That's the magic of firmographic focus. And the opposite of that is what my policy was when I was the chief revenue officer in my last company. Uh, I used to just call it no science projects, right? No yeah. science project policy. We are retailers and brands, and that's it. And anything else has got to go through an approval process, stop calling on them. And we're going to make you the smartest people in the, in the industry on retail and brands. Yeah, no, and, and I love that. And then the other, the next part that you said about like setting up the organization, like the field to, to make sure that it supports it. Because I think here's, an, here's another interesting phenomenon, uh, a trap that we fall into. Like we spend a lot of time trying to fix things. We love to fix things and we love to find issues to fix. And there's nothing more that we love to find issues with than people. We go, oh, you know, Todd, you're, you're really good at this, but you're really not so good at these other things. So let's focus on those other things and get them really, instead of going, 
God, Todd, you're great at this. Let's figure out how you can do more of what you're great of and don't worry about the things that you're not good at because somebody else is probably good at that. And I think in in sales organizations, particularly, we fail to focus on strengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just sales organizations. Uh, I mean, I looked at my children's education, (laughs) right? Like, you know, there's a huge opportunity to focus on the strengths and have them take advantage of it and develop a passion for it. I I really see that um, in sales come mostly out of forecasting. And what I mean by that is the KPIs we measure. Um, There's really only four KPIs that lead to your results, right? It's the number of opportunities, how big they are, how often you win them, and what the Mm -hmm. cycle length are. Right. That's the four. And so I see so many leaders that get stuck in these silos around, hey, listen, you're not developing enough opportunities. Like you got to like we got to work on your prospecting. Well, for us, one of the eye openers when I was chief revenue officer, my last company is I had two reps. One was great at that. One wasn't this one that wasn't two X the results of this guy. Why? Because he was doing a better job of developing those opportunities so that we won more of them at a higher dollar amount and faster. We got to get out of these silos too and start to realize that everything is a ratio, that we're working smart deals that we win at a big dollar amount often and quickly. That's the magic. Like we've got to rethink the way that we silo ourselves into metrics and look at them as a collective. And that's when you get really, really smart about what you just said, making sure that people are in the right roles and that you're using the right tools to support them too. Like that, that's another yeah. whole uh, can of worms is the, like the types of tools that we use to try to focus on a metric instead of really looking holistically and being truly buyer centric. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that, and I think, uh, I think people have fallen into the ta- into the trap of uh, of tools, tools, and more tools. Yeah. And as you said, instead of really understanding their target market, understanding how to really serve their target customer. Um, The other thing you just want to touch on is, is the forecast piece itself, right? I mean, every, every piece of research I see and every anecdotal, every piece of anecdotal evidence suggests to me that forecasting remains one of the most hit or miss things out there. And that most, you know, I would say a large proportion of people rarely actually hit their forecast for for a variety of reasons. So how do you start to really get that piece under control? Because I feel like that's the piece and and it has so many detrimental knock on effects. If you're over under missing forecasts, you know, not being really all those things that go into it. Man, I got so much on this. um, But I'm going to summarize it for you. Um, in the book, for anybody who gets it, you're going to see really quickly that I'm a nerd for the history of sales. Like when cool people are mm-hmm. doing cool things on the weekends, you <laughs> might find me like this book I just got. This is like a 1935 book um, on sales. Like that's my jam. Here's the, the thing that I would start everybody with. And there's like lots of little uh, head slappers in that chapter. But being a sales history nerd, when you look at the early 1900s, so 120 years ago, all the issues that leaders and reps faced back then are almost the same as today, but forecasting didn't seem to be one of them. And so I tried to dig into the why. What was it different back then that we're getting wrong now? And there was one thing that really jumped out at me. And it was this idea that, you know, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross in 1992, like, you know, Alec Baldwin, Mm -hmm. uh, Blake from Mitch and Murray gives that berating speech. And on the chalkboard, he's got AIDA. Right. And AIDA was attention, interest, desire, action. Uh, He actually had it as decision. So he got one word wrong. Wrong from what? You ask, well, in 1898, there was a guy named Elias St. Elmo Lewis who theorized that all buyers go through those four stages on their journey to purchase. Right. Are they paying attention? Are they interested? Have we generated a desire and are they ready to take action? That literally became the basis for every sales process and every forecasting methodology that I could find through at least 1940. Now, what? why does that matter? Well, let's go to the 1990s and early 2000s as CRM solutions started to come out from, you know, Siebel and Salesforce. Yep. Out of the box, all the stages are seller-centric, right? 
like, you know, prospect, uh, qualification, discover, demo, proposal, close, things that we're doing. We say that we are seller or that buyer, that we are buyer centric, but all of our systems processes and the endorphins that we get are based on seller milestones. No wonder mm -hmm. we started to have so much trouble predicting when a buyer would buy because all our measures are based on what sellers are doing. Back then, AIDA was the basis of every book to the point where in 1925, in a book that uh, was Elmer Ellsworth Ferris wrote, any philosopher on sales knows it's AIDA. So we're not going to talk about it, right? Like it was everything. And now you see AIDA yeah. nowhere. What I try to introduce in the book is a like for every leader to start thinking, how do I overlay buyer centrism on our stages and mm -hmm. our process? And it doesn't have to be AIDA, but it could be why change? Why us? Why yeah. now? Right. And I'd argue that order with anybody, but that's what we did at Power Reviews. Uh, when my last role, we had our stages, we weren't going to blow that up, but we did layer over the top buyer centrism. And all, suddenly our forecast, we got to within three and a half percent of our 90 day forecast, wow. six quarters in a row. And I don't believe it was all luck. Like, I think that it was just taking that new lens and having the endorphins that drive us through sales processes and the reality of where a buyer is drive a more accurate forecast, but a better relationship with the customer too. Yeah, no, and I think that's a, I think that's a really important point, and it's something actually. Um, many years ago, when I was running um, the company, actually the spin selling the Hathaway company, um, we were going through a, we were going through a process of implementing uh, some new technology and putting a sales process in, and we laid it out, and we were there sitting in this conference room. We thought this is fantastic, and we're sitting back, and I was looking at it, and then I said to one of my colleagues, I said there's something kind of wrong here. What, what do you think it is that he was looking at it? And then we both said, it's all about us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And when we, and when we, it was like, duh, you know, head slap. <laughs> um, it's all about us. And when we turned it around and changed it to make it all about the buyer, suddenly the whole thing, we, we, it, it just transformed everything in that moment of just when we realized like, well, why are we, why are we building something for ourselves? Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's the issue. And, it's still so pervasive today. And I, I'm glad yep. to see more companies and organizations thinking this way, but we it, it, it's hard to claim that you're truly buyer centric when all your processes and structures are seller centric. <laughs> Or if you, uh, or if you try and uh, if you try and contact that company that claims to be buyer centric, and it takes you, it has bots and exactly. sends you off into knowledge bases and everything, and you can never find anybody to talk to. Well, right. listen, Todd, this has been fantastic. The book is the Transparent Sales Leader: How the Power of Sincerity, Science, and Structure can transform your sales team's results. And uh, so I would recommend any sales leader to go check it out. Uh, and as I said, Todd also has the book for sales itself, The Transparent Sales. Um, all of Todd's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do, Todd. Well, I, I'm a nerd of the highest order. So I do keynotes. So lots of sales kickoffs coming up after the beginning of the year, uh, but lots of workshops. Uh, for you know, your frontline reps around messaging and positioning, around presenting. And the most popular class that I teach is called Transparent Negotiating, uh, which kind of flips traditional negotiating on its head. And then their whole uh, set of leadership curriculum, teaching you the structure and then the science of intrinsic inspiration. So you can find all of it at toddcapone.com or follow along on LinkedIn. I share a lot of my nonsense there. Yeah, listen, and I would recommend go check out Todd's book, especially if you're a, a sales, a newly minted sales leader, perhaps. But uh, you know, any if you if you took a few ideas out of it and it helped to help transform your your job, wouldn't it be worthwhile? It's a tough enough job as it is, and you don't need to learn everything from scratch or trial and error. It's not a job you want to do a lot of trial and error in, right, Todd? You don't want to read all the nerdy research that it took me to build into this book too. So hopefully, I did the homework for you. Yeah, so there you go. So you said Todd, Todd, Todd does the research, you get the benefit of the results. So listen, thanks again, Todd. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Yeah.